Yes, I'm still here, Hollywood. And coming up on today's episode... I was fun in a very, I would say, PG way. Um, I acted very sort of brash and in your face, but I mean, I was offered Playboy four times and I was offended the first time they sent me a letter. I'm like, I'm a fucking journalist. What are you doing? Here's the thing about Hollywood. When you're on top, you don't feel like, like Hollywood never spit me out uh, or chewed me up and spit me out because I, uh, you know, when I was doing my thing, I was always me. Um, but then when things aren't as good, it does kind of chew you up and spit you out. But I was treated so great in Hollywood. Um, I think because, yeah, I was, I pushed the, the envelope a little bit, maybe a bit of a pioneer in the way women dress now. I see they all dress like me on the news. If there's any lesson you learn about when coming to California to give it a try in Hollywood, is that it's rarely as glamorous or carefree as it may appear. Chasing stardom can lead down many paths and becoming the personality that you're hired to be can be a challenge. And sometimes life tosses a wrench into those plans and career and it's not always a small wrench. This is Still Here Hollywood. I'm Steve Kometko. Join me with today's guest, host, actress, model, and cancer survivor, Jillian Barbary. <laughs> I remember I was kind of scared of you. I was scared of you. Are you serious? Oh, we can talk about that. I, I thought, you know, if they were casting the movie Grease, you could play Rizzo. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, wow. Because she was kind of tough. tough. Yeah. She spoke her mind. Yeah. She wasn't afraid to get in people's faces. Yeah. Yeah. But I think inside I was more of a Sandy, uh, truly. Really? Yeah. Because in real life, I always just married the wrong people and got pushed around and fucked over. I married the wrong people, too. I married a woman. <laughs> Maybe that was my problem. I didn't I know should have, later. I should have married a woman. Jillian Barbary was one of the most recognizable faces in the city full of recognizable faces, Hollywood. As part of the morning team on Good Day LA, she became popular for her brash charm, witty banter, and clingy clothes. Throughout her career, Jillian appeared on a number of national TV shows, as well as doing the football weather forecast for the NFL on Fox. Then came her breast cancer diagnosis. Okay, Jillian. Yes, Steve. Uh, give me a rundown of everything you've done. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. Well, um, <laughs> I started, for people who don't know, I started in Montreal. I'm Canadian, and please don't hold that against me. I am a very um, happy Canadian, but I always knew I wanted to come to Hollywood. Uh, so I started in uh, weather in Montreal and quickly got a job in Miami doing weather, uh, in which Hurricane Andrew followed me, uh, they thought, they said to me, oh, don't worry, the big one will never happen. Of course it did. It was a Category 5. And I knew very little about weather, and it was quite obvious. And the Miami Herald had just ripped me apart. And I remember Kelly Mitchell, who was a fabulous anchor woman at the time, she was just a legend in Miami. And she came up to me, and she threw the newspaper, and it was just absolutely horrifying ripping me apart and she said congratulations and I said what and she said you got your first hack job out of the way this is great I mean and I thought oh what a way to look at it and I kind of looked at it after that 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 way and so when I came to LA I was 25 and just had been in Miami where it was an all women's uh newscast so there are two women anchors woman sports, woman weather, me. And everyone just happened to look like Miss America, but we all had journal journalism degrees. And it was sort of big hair, big boobs, big new, well, little news. And uh, <laughs> if it bleeds, it leads. It was WSVN in Miami, kind of a notorious station for that. So I came into LA, Ballbusters. I thought, well, LA has got to be a lot like Miami. <clears throat> it was an extremely quiet market and i didn't realize that everyone goes to bed early because we're already in la right yes we're three hours behind and so i was thinking this market is kind of boring like i just the news was i was the first weather woman girl whatever you want to call it i don't get hung up i don't get offended easily i could care less weather person but um that they hired uh in at fox at ktv and they had been metro media they had been around for a very long time and um, I just remember thinking, 
I just want to have fun. It's not rocket science. It's 72. Partly, partly cloudy, slight breeze. Yeah, and a little <laughs> bit of smog. Okay, a lot of smog. And that back to you, Steve. So they asked me to come on the morning show. I was doing three minutes a day, and they said, let's do three hours a day. And I was like, no, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> I used to go to bed at 3 a.m. in Miami. Um, but eventually they convinced me uh, that it would be more money and you know you could get out, we're gonna have we're gonna have fabulous actors on the show and chefs and fun and I got there and it was anything but that it was like a horrible set it was cheesy and I thought oh well fuck it I want to make the best of this I'm gonna have some fun so um, I did yes you came off that way too did I as though you were a good time. <laughs> As Betty good. Davis once said, there goes the good time that was had by all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was a good time. I was fun. Were you? Yes, I was. Um, Any regrets about that? None. None whatsoever. I was fun in a very, I would say, PG way. Um, I acted very sort of brash and in your face. But, I mean, I was offered Playboy four times, and I was offended the first time they sent me a letter. I'm like, I'm a fucking journalist. What are you doing? Uh, the second year, and it's because I was on the NFL that they were they kept sending letters. Um, and they started when I was 36 and they ended when I was 40. And I was like, oh, I guess I've hit that wall. Um, but, you know, I said no every time. And the money, it was, it, it was very big at first. And every year it kind of went down. It trickled down because I think Playboy was having issues themselves. Um, I did go to my boss at, the NFL and I said would it be okay to you by the fourth year I was kind of thinking about it and he said would it be okay like that's our audience but at Good Day LA different attitude entirely and that was my bread and butter um I you know I was single at the time um I didn't want to lose my job I had done a lot of things outside of Good Day LA, like sitcoms, and I was lucky enough to do dating shows and the NFL and movies. They always said yes to me, or at least I would do it. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is for, uh, you know, approval. And so I felt very lucky, and I didn't want to lose that. I'm a little, you know, I, I I've made a lot of decisions out of fear, which will fuck you up later in life. Let's just say that. And I mean that in every respect, not just TV, in life. What else have you done? Let's move along with this resume a little bit. Okay. Um, well, you know, it's funny. I, I did a show called VIP with Pamela Anderson only because I met Pam at a party for Fox. And we were told not to talk to Pam. And I was like, what? Uh, mm, she's Canadian. That can't be. No. Canadians are awesome. So I was sitting at the bar, of course. And she came over. She's like, hey, you're the Canadian. I like you. I'm going to write a part for you in my show. And I'm like, what? Okay. And just naively, um, she's like, yeah. Oh, my God. I'm just thinking about it now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bye. And so she leaves and I get a script and I say to my agent, oh, I, I guess, you know, it's a cattle call. And he calls me back. And he's like, no, she wrote a part for you called Foxy Levin. I was like this Jewish journalist. And I was like, oh, fabulous. So a lot of my... The things that I got in Hollywood were out of naivete. In other words, you know, I was on Maxim's Hot 100 list. They had a huge party. And my publicist was there. And she's like, where the fuck are you? And I'm like, I'm at home in pajamas. Watch. Why would I be there? She's like, because you're number 87. I go, how embarrassing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and she's like, but you're on the list. And I go, I, ugh. you know, I'm like a total homebody. Um, there was a time I went out a lot, but... Everything I got outside of Good Day LA was given to me. Every movie part, every sitcom, every dating show. I'm a horrible auditioner. I have massive anxiety. Uh, I had depression with not just my cancer, but the IRS. I don't know if you, they were death and taxes at my door at the same time. So my life collapsed and I had a, a nervous breakdown. So that was fun. And um, all the while raising two kids on my own with breast cancer and no child support. Life was a fucking bowl of cherries. And I've always looked at things very positively. And my oncologist said, if you have a good attitude, that's half the battle. And I said, well, then fuck it. I'm going to win this battle. 
I got that. But the IRS, that was the big thing. Cancer, I was like, done. Yeah, cool. Whatever. Do your thing. Doctors, pump me full of whatever you got to do. And then, you know, bring me to the brink of death and pull me back. I'm good. But it was the IRS. It's that black fucking cloud. And I lost everything. I ended up having to sell my house. And I gave them 1.2 million cash. Still not enough. Got to do this. When they say they'll, they'll settle, they didn't. Uh, at one time I owed 750,000. I gave, I said, okay, I'll give you 500,000 cash, take 250. I had a job. I could still work the radio show. They said no. So when people say, oh, they'll work with you. Bullshit. So I've had that kind of adversity. Um, and it's tough. So I went from a big house, beautiful home, lost that of 23 years. It was my dream home. I finally put in the marble kitchen that I'd always wanted and I had breast cancer and I had to sell it and I never got to use it. And I saw that young couple moving in and they're in television and they had two little kids. So they were moving into my kids' rooms. And I was like, that's the circle of life, man. You know, when they talk about Hollywood, you know, chewing you up and spitting you out, I never experienced that. because so I was f treated so great in Hollywood. Um, I think because, yeah, I was, I pushed the, the envelope a little bit maybe a bit of a pioneer in the way women dress now. I see they all dress like me on the news, but, um, you know, Steve blames me for that. But uh, I wanted to look like a woman. I didn't want to wear a jacket anymore. You know, I want to look like a woman, how women dress. And I had so much female fan mail from that. So I went to my bosses because they're like, you know, you're dressing a little sexy. I said, okay, here's my fan mail. They're all women. So not men. Which is a desirable demographic. Yeah, they're all, because I tell them, hey, I got this here, this I got at H&M, and this I got at Prada, you know, how to look, how to get a Vogue look on a, you know, a Marshall's budget. And so, anyway, long story short, um, every job was given to me, and I did, I did Mad TV, um, I did a movie for Ryan Phillippe, he directed me. So I would get all of these things because they would see me on TV and think I was funny or they think, oh, she's ballsy or she's got timing. Let's get her. I didn't even know what the fuck I was doing half the time. I remember my agent going, do you have your sides? And I was like, what are sides? <laughs> and I, just being so ignorant, you know, walking into movie sets and they'd say, we hire, and I go, oh, you hired me because of Good Day Late? No, we watched you on Howard Stern. We thought you were great. And I was like, oh, I had so many offers because I was on Howard Stern. And I would take them. But the one audition I went to, this is the God's honest truth. I was sitting in my car in the parking lot. One audition. I have to be given a role or I can't, I don't have the confidence. I have fucking zero self-confidence. And yeah. You fake it good. Do I? Self-confidence, yes. Yeah, I have none. Dorothy can tell you, our friend, our mutual friend, Dorothy. Um, even back then I had zero, like, pfft. I must have faked it well. But then I had a narcissist in my life for m many years. And what little you have, they just chip it. And then it's completely gone. And you're a shell of your former self. And then you're working on that. You're like, what the fuck just happened in my life? So that took me about five years to figure out and a lot of therapy. But the one audition I went to, I don't remember what it, exactly it was for, but my agent sent me out to it. So most of the jobs just came in. Hey, you know, Paramount wants you for this or Sony or Todd Phillips is, is directing this movie or Ryan Phillippe wants you. And it was great because th they already knew what they were getting, right? It's like being a rock star. You're paying a ticket to see Motley Crue or Metallica. So for me, I'm like, okay, they know what they're getting. It's all good. But for me to go out and audition, so I go out, I've, I did two in my life. And the first one I walked in and I shit you not. I fucking walk in and there's Cary Grant's daughter sitting there. And I go, oh, it's Jennifer Grant. Jennifer, right. And I go, oh, fuck. And I walk out. I'm like, I no. Just no. Because I'm a cinephile and I, Cary Grant is one of my absolute favorites. And James Bond. I always wanted to be a Bond girl. You know, growing up in Canada, I just thought Sean Connery was the shit. And then Daniel Craig. In between, not so much. But Connery and Craig are my men. And so that was that. Second audition I ever went, years later, and it was kind of a handful of women that were plucked by, um, uh, it, was, it was Larry David and, and Jeff and Larry Charles, right? So 
I go in the room, I go in, the, and it's everyone I've done sitcoms with. So it's Constance Zimmer. I did a sitcom right over here on Radford called uh, Good Morning Miami. And then there was, uh, so I was with Constance Zimmer, Tiffany Thiessen. So I was comfortable. I knew most of the women in the room because we had all worked together at some point or they were on Good Day LA or I was friends with them. So I felt really confident. And then Larry David walked in and I was like, oh God. And I thought this, if, if there's ever been a show for me to audition for, it's this. Cause it's ad libbing. It's what I do. It's going to be fucking amazing. I shit the bed. I didn't know because he's Larry David and I have such a respect and love for him. It's like Howard Stern, how much I love him. And I was like, I was all freaked out and I just didn't because he's him. You have to let him shine. And I, I didn't know how to play. So the episode, I ended up watching it and it was, they picked the, the girl they picked was brilliant. Like she just nailed it. And I would never know what, how to do what she did. Cause I'm not a trained actress, you know? <laughs> so I, it, it's just so different for me. I saw, I watched one of the um, uh, videos you put up. I don't know, do you call them videos anymore? Yeah. I watched one of them uh, that you were sitting in your car talking to the camera, yeah. just to the fans. And, yeah. and, and you said, um, my life is either a shit show or a sitcom. Yeah. It is. Is it? Yes. You know, I think about uh, the shit that hit the fan at the time and trying to get sober. Because I think when you're fucked up and drunk and you don't care because you're in your own little hell, it makes all that stuff when you're sober so much worse. Because now you got to face it. So when I was going through all that, um, I was feeling so many things, not even sobriety. That wasn't even one of them. I'm, I, and I told you earlier, I'm friends with Heather Locklear and Heather was going through rehab down the street, literally walking distance from me. And I was getting chemo at the time. And I was, I looked like Uncle Fester. I mean, I was bald and huge and I'm still on 10 medications. And so it's, 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 it's a thing every day. But through our friendship and we've known each other from the Melrose Place days. In fact, I was on Melrose Place. In fact, we have a scene together and somebody sent it to me and I sent it to her and we were just dying over it. But uh, she, um, yeah, she, we were laughing. She drove me here today and we were talking about how I, everything's off limits for me. And for her, she's sort of don't complain, don't explain, you know, the Kate Moss theory, you know, she's like, meh. She gets offered stuff all the time. She's like, meh. And for me, I'm in fight or flight and I have been for five years. So we sort of formed a bond where I messaged her one day and I go, fuck, it was after chemo. I said, I'm an alcoholic. And she goes, okay, please don't ask me to be your sponsor. <laughs> and, and that's who she is. I mean, she's hilarious. So that's kind of been our, you know, our friendship. Um, Why did you drink? Oh, wow. Why did I drink? Whew. I know why I did. <laughs> right? All right. I've been sober nine years now. Oh, that's awesome. I, I mean, had I, 10 years once and I... I read. And I moved back to Chicago and that yeah. triggered me. Yeah. I get why. I read your story. Sorry. That's okay. And Heather read it to me yesterday and I was like, I should be interviewing him. Oh, no. Because our stories are very similar in that... You know, I get it. I would be doing the same thing. And um, because here's the thing about Hollywood. When you're on top, you don't feel like, like Hollywood never spit me out uh, or chewed me up and spit me out because I, w you know, when I was doing my thing, I was always me. Um, but then when things aren't as good, it, it, it does kind of chew you up and spit you out because for 20 years we were on Good Day LA. And at the end, they just treated Dorothy and I like nothing. And even when they did Steve's 20-year reunion, they cut Dorothy and I out of 17 of those years. How do you do that? And it was like we didn't exist. It was so hurtful. And, um, but that's not why I drank. I drank, you know, privately for so long. Um, 
I, I think I've spoken about, you know, my childhood. I was very blessed. I got adopted by a great family. Um, and I, you know, unfortunately was molested as a kid. And it really molded the way I thought about sexuality and who I was. And I just, it, it altered my view and I became very tough. I became very uh, unattached from that person, detached and um, carefree, carefree in a very uh, dangerous way. I tried every drug out there. I drove cars way too fast. Um, I should be dead how many times over and that's from my teenage years and I look at my daughter and she's just 16 and so proper and good and I'm whoo it's amazing to that's me that's Ruby yeah that's my Ruby she's more like her father very disciplined um and I think my son is more of an artist like me but I don't know I think the drinking it comes from um a very deep you do it for fun at first and I think if you're a personality like mine where you it's an imposter syndrome, like I would think, why am I in Hollywood? And what the fuck am I doing here? And what, like, how did I get, you know? But I think just about everybody here thinks that same way. You what do. are they going to find out? Well, you've interviewed everyone from the biggest. Well, a lot of people, yeah. <laughs> right. The Sophia Lorenz of the world, the Julia Roberts. Do you think they have imposter syndrome? Oh, yes. You do? Really? Maybe not so much uh, as they after they go along for a while, but uh, I remember Julia. I loved her from the first time I met her. She was just great. Yeah. But um, she was a little skittish at first. Yeah. You know, uh, I think I think everybody is. You can't. Yeah. Unless you're. Um, excuse yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. Didn't mean to say his name. Uh, you know. Well, he's amazingly brash. Yeah. Steve and I used to talk about, like, he would come on the show as he was a great guest, and even Howard Stern says a great guest doesn't make a great <laughs> Whoa. Uh, uh, that's a whole other story. Right. Um, but y you, you've seen that side of Hollywood, both sides, and I feel like it's such a fine line. Like, when they decide, whoever they are, that something, like I read the story, you're actually Heather... Locklear read me your story and people and I was and everyone remembers you and Heather Locklear's mom was like oh my gosh I remember and my friends are like oh my god Steve Kameko you 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 were the beginning of that sort of that real and you treated it with respect that job you weren't just flashy bullshit the way it is done now like we care about butt implants we care about it's so so stupid um or like little bites on you know TikTok or and I think there's a place for all of that but um I think what happened to you what happened to me what happened to Dorothy is a great example of how frivolous and how silly and how mean and dismissive and uh hurtful it can Hollywood can be but I suppose that's like any job and it's how you deal with it after and so when you have a shit show like Heather and I will sit and laugh for hours over the shit that she's been through and I've been through. I mean, the stuff she is the funniest woman I've ever met, and the story, the drunk stories that we can share with each other, and the stuff that she's helped me get through makes me uh, sort of brave every day a little bit better. When did the cancer diagnosis come about? Well, I was uh, there's a girl named Lisa Ashley who actually introduced Heather and I. She worked at the NFL she was a makeup artist and she decided to start a group I think she was 40 at the time um, where we would do mammograms and mimosas and we did it the four seasons and they had an image M&M yeah m and m and they have an imaging center and we're like Ugh, nobody wants to get their tits squished in a machine and mine were real and I, you know but I was like oh I guess I'm 40 I have to start so I started at 40 and every year I was clear and at 52 I was not going to go that year. And I'm always the bartender. Of course I am. And I make a wicked French 75, if I may. And because it's Kate Moss's favorite tipple. And she's my favorite model. So I started drinking those. And I was like, oh, fuck it. It's Sunday brunch. I'm going to have one. And then Sunday turned into Monday. And you know how that goes. Oh, yes. So. <laughs> and so um, uh, it was my turn, I guess. And they kept calling me back down. 
And I, I kept saying, I got a call back. You know, there was about 40 girls. It ended up being very, you know, our M&M day was very small at first. And by the end, we had sponsors, Nike, Fox Sports, blah, blah, blah. and we had big gift bags and it was fun and until it wasn't fun. So I uh, literally went down for the third time and they started doing, they're like, oh, he wants to do an ultrasound. And I'm like, oh, I can assure you I'm not pregnant. And uh, they're like, mm. and they were very serious and quiet. And that's when I knew. I'm like, oh, fudge. And then uh, they put me in a room and the phone rings and there's nobody in there. And I'm like, hello? <laughs> Am I supposed to pick it up? <laughs> what the fuck? And he's like, yes, this is your radiologist. You need to go to get a biopsy tomorrow. Do not wait till Monday. Go tomorrow. And I go, uh, okay, what the fuck is biopsy? So then... I go back upstairs and my phone rings. It's my general practitioner. And he go, I go, what's up? And he said, how are you? Very serious. And I go, fine, how are you? And he goes, wow, you sound good. I go, well, why wouldn't I? He said, because you have cancer. I go, what the fuck? And he, I go, how do you know? He goes, because they just called me. You have textbook cancer. And I go, oh, for sh I go, for real? He goes, yeah. And I go, for real, real? He goes, yes. So I go back up and I said, I got to go. And I called the radio station and I said, I have to figure out a way how to tell my kids. So the good news is I had just gone through it with Deborah Tate, who's Sharon Tate's sister, who's a very good friend of mine. And we go to all the Manson, you know, uh, hearings and try to keep them behind bars for 25 years. And that's a whole other story. The Quentin Tarantino. And we were, I was very involved in that in the movie and which was incredible because we got to see Deborah on the big screen and we were sitting with Brad Pitt and Leo and I grabbed Deb's hand and I said, there's Sharon. Like he got the rights to Matt Helm's movie and Torino, Tar uh, Tarantino put it in there. But um, I told the kids, that was my biggest fear telling the kids. But I said, remember what Auntie Deb went through? Yeah. I said, I have the same thing. And they were like, okay. Because she didn't lose her hair. But I ended up finding out, yeah, mine was lymph node. Mine was a little more serious. I had to get double mastectomy and the whole thing. It was fine. It really, chemo didn't affect me. I worked every single day through it in radio. Looked after two kids. No, I, it was fine. And when people ask, I'm like, it, it, it was a breeze, not a problem. Um, yeah, it's a lot better. It's my cancer killer. And you have to really go in there going, chemo is your friend. It's there to help you. And that was my attitude. Thank you. Like, bring it on. Let's go. Chop, chop. You also said in the video that I watched that you hadn't dated in 10 years. 10 years, yeah. Never. I have not had, I've not dated, had sex. Do you sex. miss it? No. Ugh, never again. Never again. Ever? Never again. I can solidly say that and mean it. Never again will I ever trust a man, love a man, open my heart to a man, give money to a man. I'm done, done, done. They're mentally, they just, nah, I'm not going to waste my time. I've been there, done that. I, I don't know how to not, if I go in, I go all in. You get everything, right? I open my wallet, my home, my heart, my life, my love, my brain, everything is yours. But if you take advantage of that and all of it, especially the brain part, uh, then I'm done. Make me feel I'm crazy, gaslight, whatever. I'm done. It takes a long time to figure it out because I'm, I'm not that person. I don't even, you don't know what's happening while it's happening. So uh, my girlfriends always tell me, yeah, there's some good men out there. I go, awesome. Yay. Not for me. I don't care. I have no interest. How do you feel about getting older? I don't care. You don't care. Don't I care. hate it. Do you? Yes. Why? You look because fucking just, great. You're lucky. No, You're a please. man. You're allowed to get older. You're allowed to get silver. You look the same, but you're silver. You're allowed. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I don't know. The women, they- I don't like the aches and pains. Yeah, I, I don't like the stroke I had a year and a half ago. Oh my God. I, I read. Yeah. You I'm know, so sorry. I don't- I, I, like you, my, my, I came out here for this weekend and I forgot all my medication at home. So I, Are you okay? I take. Yeah, I'm okay right now. I, I hope I will be by the time I Is get it home. Your stroke medication? Yeah, a little bit of everything. Uh, I get it. And in the morning, I take ten different pills. Same. I'm and on antidepressants though, and when you stop those, I remember my pharmacy forgot me on a Friday, and I was like, no big fucking deal. My son's coming down to visit. It's fine. And I'd rather be with him. So I'm hanging out with him and his friends. I'm driving them to the movies. They're 13 years old. Take them to the beach. Da, 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 da. Now it's Saturday. I call. Da, da, da. Oh, yeah, it's a service. Fine. I can wait till Sunday. Maybe I'll get Sunday. I start to get the brain zaps. And brain zaps are like, 
like you're talking to somebody and I don't know how else to explain it. Then I started to get the shakes and I had taken the boys to a movie and I was parked beside a Ventura County police officer. And I looked over and I just moved into an apartment because I lost the second house. And I go, do I fucking live in Ventura County? And I started to get all shaky and paranoid. I opened up the door. I vomited. I guess I was going through withdrawals. So I never went through that when I stopped drinking. So when we think about what's legal and what's not, you know, I'm on Wellbutrin and Effexor. And when I went off that, I didn't even go off it. When they forgot me, I had to get an emergency uh, prescription. My body... So I, it's so important, right? Like your meds are, I'll never, like it scares me to get off that shit. Like I'm almost thinking I'd rather try um, all this other therapy, not the zap zap one, the EK, what's that one where they, it's electric. She's like, oh, it's not like it used to be. All I picture is like a rubber thing I'm biting down on and they're like zapping me. She said, no, it's not like that anymore. Like getting a lobotomy. Like getting a lobotomy. Yeah, it's scary. But there's another one they have called um, uh, ketamine. And I was like, right. should I try that? I don't know. So I'm, I'm kind of, it's scary, but I, I get, I have what they call long-term effects of chemo. So I have to take a lot of um, gabapentin. My, my bones hurt a lot and I can't wear high heels and I can't, which is hard because, you know, that was sort of who I was like that, the, the hair, the boobs, the heels and what breast cancer does. And you learn quickly. Like, I don't have vanity. That's the one thing about me. People think, oh, you were the sex pot. You went, whatever. I said, chop my tits off. Oh, do you want to wear the cold cap? What's that? Well, your hair won't fall out. Sure. Okay, you have to come in four hours early. Why? Because we have to freeze your follicles so your hair doesn't fall out. Then you'll do four hours of chemo. I go, fuck that. I'll have four hours with my kids. Thank you very much. And I'll be bald and wear a wig. I don't care, Steve. So when people say, oh, you, oh my gosh, it's like life changing. No. For me, it's not. I don't sit and weigh myself. I haven't weighed myself in 40 years. I know when I was a twig. Now I know when you're a pig. Like, it's just like you get it, you know? Um, well, didn't you do commercials for... Nutrisystem. Yeah. Yeah. And that was great. I was 43, 44 in a bikini. And I had from flabs to abs. But, and you can't... You doc- were sensational. Thank you. You can't doctor those either because that's like the, you know, legally you can't make a claim. Truth in advertising. Yeah. So people would say, oh, they airbrush you. And I'm like, oh, well, I wish they did. No, I got a spray tan. But they can't legally do that because it's a, it's a, it's a claim. It's a weight loss claim. So they can't doctor the photos. Sure. I look at that. And that was after two kids and I'm proud, but do I aspire to constantly be? No, my life has been my kids for 10 years. And I'm amazed that I got out of it uh, that I'm getting out of it without drinking like I did. Like I drank to the point of f- flat out on my face. And that's okay. But I was a, you know why I was a functional alcoholic? Not really. I'm lying. That's a lie. That's not true. I went to the radio station drunk. I was functioning around the kids because I drank a lot at home. I didn't drink in public a lot because I didn't like going out. You know, we isolate. Oh. <laughs> right? Who needs a glass? That was me. Who needs a glass? Exactly. Yeah. Straight from the bottle. A hundred percent. Yep. I've never done it straight from the bottle, but it doesn't fucking matter. Like, I always tell the kids, you know, there's no difference. You can't heroin. What? It, I've never done any hard. I never did heroin or, uh, but certainly I tried Coke at 38. Like, I lived in Miami. I was 24. Hello? It was all around me, but I was a very naive girl from Canada. I tried it at 38 and I loved it. And I was skinny and I could do everything. And then by 40, uh, I think I got married at 39 and I got pregnant at 40. And I was like, bye. And that was the last time I ever touched it. So I, wine, that's my thing. I could give or take any drug. If you put Percocet or Gabapentin beside each other, I would grab the Gabapentin because my bones hurt so my nerves are so um fucked up that a percocet a vicodin they do nothing but the nerve blocker which doesn't get you high and it's not addictive is the best thing for me you know it really is helpful we'll be back in a moment but as you get older and you have these women around you the same age it's so, uh, there's nothing like women in their 50s that are smart, that have been there, that are divorced, that have been through it, that lift you. And I can tell you I have a community of women. 
your life also consists of painting. You do, yeah. you're, you're a painter now. Yeah, I always was. I, I started at about 15. Um, and uh, I just go, I would go in and out of it. I painted in Miami, a little bit in Montreal, mostly Miami. And then when I came to LA, I, I painted a lot. Um, and then number one liked it, number two, not so much. All my paintings ended up in the closet. Um, and then Jeff Lewis came to redo the house and when I, for a show, and when I came home after four days of not seeing the house and you walk into this home that Jeff has redone, I saw my paintings and I bawled because I hadn't seen them in years. And you do, I see you online, online all the time. Is it Ask Jillian? You do all, all kinds of makeup tips and where to buy. Yeah, like the... Cheaper you know, than... You know what's great about getting older? And I will I will say this, that when I was younger and maybe 30... Because I was very... In, until I was 47, I would say the wheels fell off the bus at 50. And I mean drinking and getting bloated and then getting cancer. But until I was like 48, 49, I was still on TV at KTLA I was at. I was 48, 49. I was super tiny, in great shape. I looked... I didn't look at my age, whatever. I still had guys 30 asking me out. And... Um, but I, um, was always aspirational for women. I like to think because I shared, but as you get older and you have these women around you the same age, it's so, uh, there's nothing like women in their fifties that are smart, that have been there, that are divorced, that have been through it, that lift you. And I can tell you, I have a community of women. I have been through it. Um, Dorothy has been a huge help. Lisa Breckenridge, Lisa Guerrero, there's been a huge amount of support from women in television that have gotten me through my surgeries. And I had a 10 hour surgery recently that Dorothy helped me with. And it was a seven week recovery till you could drive. And it was a big one, but it was, it was wonderful. And then I have a community on, people will think I'm insane, Steve, but I have a community on Instagram and I talk about them like they're my, and people are like, oh, so where does Aubrey live? I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, but you talk about her like she's your best friend. These women help me. I've never met any of them. There's a group of eight of them. They range from uh, accountants to social workers to, uh, they're incredible. And they're like, okay, where's your life at? I go in the toilet. Well, what do you need? I'm like, well, I haven't done taxes because I didn't, I don't know how to. And I had to fire my money guy and this is shit, that shit. And um, I don't know where to start. And so they were like, okay, we're going to take over and do this, this, this. And they're slowly sorting things out for me because I've been frozen in fear. I don't know if you've ever felt that. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like there's this impending doom hanging over you and you're trying to act like everything's okay or you're out, you, you avoid friends because it's going to cost this or you're going to, like you're no longer that person. Like I used to be able to pay for everybody and everything and then you, now you're like, oh, I don't want to go, mm -mm. Yeah, I can't meet you guys or I have something else. I can't make it. It's weird, right? Yeah. And so... Sometimes getting out of bed was hard for me. You have children at least that, yeah. you know, you have to kind of do it for that. I have yeah. two dogs. Well, you know? I do know that feeling though. And trying to fake it. Like I remember one of them saying, you know, mommy, why are you sad? And I was like, what? Because I thought I had faked it so well. And they were so young. They didn't understand. And they're like, well, you smile, but you're sad. And I was like, oh my gosh, like you cannot fake that with kids. I tried. Um, and I was like, I'm not sad. Their dad remarried and had a baby. And that I liked because at least it gave them some normalcy when they would go up to visit him, um, that they would have Thanksgiving. And that was the thing. I was like, go. Because my family's in Canada. I always gave him Christmases and and whatever, because I wanted them to feel that sense of family. I don't have it. I mean, I did, I was lucky enough to meet my birth family. Um, and they've got quite a story, but the, the, I never knew my nationality. And so I would always have people say, oh, you're this, you're that. I always knew I was European. I always knew it. And, and so, yeah, I could, I'm Lithuanian. My father's full Lithuanian, um, born and raised in London. And my mother is born and raised in Ireland. But the crazy story is that my cousin has a son with Brian Jones of the Rolling Stones. And so then he, uh, 
Donovan adopted that boy. So she's been married to Donovan for 52 years or something. So we had this big family reunion. And I said to Donovan, you know, you've been on Good Day LA so many times. I've interviewed him. And she was in the green room, my cousin. Like, how insane is that? They live in Ireland. She's from England. I'm from Canada. She's my birth cousin. We're all in Hollywood. What the, how is this? It's mind blowing, you know? So one day I do want to go to England. They're all painters, artists, and rock stars and singers. And I feel like that's my place. Uh, I've always felt that way. I've had a sort of tug towards England ever since I was a child. Where can people find you if they want to look you up? Well, probably all the Pornhub sites, Steve. <laughs> no, uh, that would be just j ask Jillian. I've never seen you on there. No, no, I would. I'm not on any of that. <laughs> um, but I, I really regret not doing Playboy because now I don't have all that. It's like when you're known for boobs or hair and cancer says, fuck you, we're taking both of those away. Oh, and you're going to get fat. Yay! You have to have a, you have to have a good attitude, and I do. But I really do wish I did Playboy because I would have some, you know, like, oh, yeah, they were pretty or whatever. And my kids are like, no, Mom, we're glad you didn't. So it is what it is. But I'm at Ask Jillian, and I love meeting new people, and I'm pretty, uh, I'm a pretty open book. But I have to say I'm really honored to be here because reading your story, I'm – the whole way here, I kept saying to Heather Locklear, why is he interviewing me? Like, I, I feel like everybody should be interviewing you, People Magazine. Like – what? And then I said, stay in the car because if they see you, bigger name line two, <laughs> they're going to want Heather Locklear. <laughs> and the first thing your producer said is, we want Heather. And I said, Heather will never do it. Heather doesn't do anything. She doesn't, you know, but she loves you and she knows exactly who you are. And she said, she loves a story like that. Like she's, so she just sends you her best. Thanks. And uh, as I, I as I do, I think you're you're incredible, and you're you're like a legend here, like Steve Edwards. I was so intimidated by you. You came to E once when I we did. were looking for a um, a co-host. We were going through missing co-hosts. Oh my god! They were looking for someone new to do E News Daily with me. And <gasps> they brought you in for uh, an audition. See an audition. See, I probably should the bet on that too because oh. I'm not good at auditioning. Right? And who did they hire? Was it Jules? I can't remember who yeah. they hired at that time. Uh, Jules was on staff, so they wouldn't Jules, have had to bring her in. She was lovely. And I, I, you know, I don't, I met some people at E, but I was always intimidated by you. And I'll tell you why. I always felt that you were very, you were, I would be the bad kid in the class and you would be the teacher and that I'd be scared of. <laughs> and, 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 and that you were so in control and so, calm and methodical and so well read and so you just knew everything you were smart and 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 serious and I would be like oh, I'm gonna get in trouble with him and I was Dorothy always told me how nice you were and so did Steve um, but I was intimidated by you but mine is all a it's an act I'm like a, an idiot on the inside very insecure uh, I've become more dumb because of the gabapentin um, yeah I, but one of the things you do that's very hard to do in front of a camera is be yourself. I can't be anybody else, sadly. I wish I could. <laughs> I wish I could at times. Um, Judy Garland used to say, be yourself. Everybody else is taken. I love her. <laughs> There's a picture of me, and you'll appreciate this. It was at one of my birthday parties. I'm at my neighbor's. My hair was growing back in. And when your hair grows in from chemo, and this is all my hair now, thank goodness, but it grows back as black as my shirt and really curly. Now, I'm bloated, I'm wasted, I'm passed out. Okay, I'm at the table completely passed out. And there's some video, and somebody's video, and, know, and all my friends are there all dressed up, skinny, fucking drinking with their martinis, summer smoking. And it's just this beautiful night overlooking all the lights of Hollywood. And then they pan in on Judy Garland. I said, what the fuck is Judy Garland doing at my birthday? It was me! And I've got my feet up on their barefoot on the table. And I'm like, eh, and I got the short black curly hair. And it was Judy in her latter days. And uh, I, I was like, wow, that chick's got a drinking problem. It was all out there to see. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You can just tell. And um, whoa, it didn't stop me, though. I, I was full on Judy for another few years. <laughs> Sometimes it takes what it takes, right? Yes, it takes what it takes. We got to land this plane. 
Yeah. What I, do you want to leave people with? Well, uh, a thought of this, stay in the moment, because, you know, when you, I know this sounds really stupid and profound, but if you think too much about, you have that anxiety if you think about tomorrow and then if you think about yesterday, you get depressed. So I try to stay right here right now and not freak out. And that's a lot of what my, my channel is about makeup ch tips and all that stuff. And, but a lot of it they tell me is when I'm just talking and shooting a shit like this, like that's what they like and they want to hear. Um, I know the men liked other things, but that was another Jillian. You know, I, I, I don't like to say she's dead, but she's, um, she, I'm a different Jillian now, you know, I, I'm, I, I've always been this girl. I don't know how to be anybody else, but I, 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 I'm, I'm much more gentle than people think. <laughs> I always was. When you were at the peak of your powers, whatever that means. <laughs> I wish I knew I had any powers. Oh, well, <laughs> when you were, um, an the... example of physical beauty mm -hmm. and popularity and, yeah. and power, were you hit on? Oh, there were certainly, um, yeah. I mean, I went out with a couple of football players. That was interesting. Uh, and they were huge names, and I don't follow football, so they were so insulted when I had no fucking clue who they were. I don't care. Uh, one of them was like, wait a minute, you don't know that I did this and that? I said, I do the weather on the NFL. I don't sit and follow you. I could care less. Uh, but yes, I was hit on by a few actors. Um, and producers, and I said no to all of them. Um, they scared me. I felt they were out of my league. Um, I didn't think that, I, I always felt so low of myself that, and I'm glad that I didn't now because I know one of the producers turned out to be a total scuzzball guy. The actors were at the peak of their career. And I remember thinking, why would he want to go out with me? Like he could have Jessica Alba, he could have, you know, thinking of the women that he'd starred with, why me? Um, and then I was on that dating app for a while, Raya, Raya, whatever it is, and you would see people on there, many famous men, and they would hook up or they'd say yes and they'd start talking to you and then I would just ghost them. I just couldn't respond because I'd have no game. My girlfriend's like, you're Jillian Barbary. I'm like, no, I'm not. I, I, I don't, that's a person, like, I, yes, I'm real and it's part of me, but I'm very insecure and I, I don't, I don't feel confident enough to go out with a big name person. I did, I'll tell you who I, you know, there were rock stars that actually hit on me and it felt more organic. And so we did end up going out and having fun and dating and having all, if it's organic, yes. If I feel like it's, they're really into me. But when it was kind of like this sort of hitting on like you felt like you were one of many girls that they would hit on or just I don't know yeah I, I probably went out with more rappers and ballers and rock stars than I did actors or producers I don't remember any real big actors although there's one regret I love Colin Farrell and he it was just when I found out that I was Irish and we were obviously he is and uh he was doing a film uh I think it I don't know what it was, but he was on satellite and um, you know what that's like. So they don't know exactly who is. Oh, it's KTTV. It's KTLA. It's whatever. And then he, he, we heard him and he's like, oh, is this the one with Jillian? And I was like, well, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, Jillian, is it you? And I said, yeah, hi. And he's like, yeah, Irish. And I said, yeah, actually, my mom's from County Cork. I just found her, you know. That is the one. Woo! That's when I read Britney Spears book, I'm like, nice. Two weeks with that. Absolutely fabulous girl. So happy for her. I love Britney. Um, but yeah, I've had more interactions with people like Britney Spears and than I have with men. Like it's just so strange. But I have been asked out by guys, big time director. There was a huge director. Ugh. I just wasn't attracted. And also the parties, you go to a few parties and they all seem, they're all the same after a while, right? Like have, I, it's not my scene either, not my scene, but for a while you're invited to everything for a while. So you sort of dig in and have fun with it because at the time I really wasn't thinking, oh, this is going to end one day. I really didn't. I was so naive. I didn't even think Good Day LA would end one day, but I knew mm. I could see the, when they didn't renew Dorothy, 
and then they took down all my my Howard Stern and Dave Chappelle posters. I was like, ooh, the end is near. I smell it in the air. And it was. And they started rotating girls, filling in for Dorothy and me. But the ones filling in for Dorothy were also filling in for me, possibly to take my job. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Like I said, I think it's like any other job. It, it It is just a job. I think it was when Simon Cowell left whatever show, AGT, and they replaced him with Howard Stern. Like, it made me feel like everyone is replaceable. You know, when people would say to me, oh, there are all these changes, but they never let you go because, and I would say, I'm not that stupid. Of course they will. I always knew in the back of my mind, of course they will, no matter what difference I brought to that but show. But it still hurts when it happens. It still hurts when it happens. And in fact, Dorothy and I, it brought us really a lot closer together, especially when the things went down with Steve. She called me that morning and she said, has this ever happened to you? I said, absolutely not. And it brought us, I, I really stood up for Steve. It still hurts though. And I said to her, did, did you ever cry? When we had a national show, they would let us do the first, so we were national for three years. It was called Good Day Live. And then, <laughs> then they took us off that show. So then we became the warm up for Debbie Matinopoulos and Arthel Neville. So we would have to, leave the set at 9 a.m. I'd have to pack up. It's like, what the fuck? Like we helped, we, we, we decorated this party. Now we're being kicked out, like, fuck you. So we go to our car and I said, I'd always cry. And she goes, me too. And I'm like, you were crying over there. I was crying over here, you know? It always does hurt, but you do get over it. It took me two years to watch Good Day LA. And I was in Beverly Hills with my sister. She was visiting from Canada. My birth I found out I had two birth sisters, full. Like my mom and dad got married after they gave me away. And um, so I have two full sisters and it's amazing. We're all like very close. And so one was visiting and we were in the Beverly Hills Hotel. And because I, she's like, oh, do you know? Da -da -da -da. And she's obsessed with Snoop Dogg. And I'm like, oh, I, I know Snoop, so let's call him. So we called Snoop and she was just like, Oh my God, he's talking to her. She, we're having the time of our lives and it's literally seven in the morning. And she goes, let's put on Good Day LA. And I was like, no, I cannot, no. I don't want to hear the music. I don't want to see the people. No, I haven't watched it. She goes, well, let's just do it. It'll be fun. I go, no, for you, maybe not for me. And she's kind of got a fun personality. She used to work at TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival. So she's, she's more like me. The other one is a professor. She's an engineer. She's the smart one. And so... I go to the bathroom and I came out and there it was, it was on. And I was like, dear God. And I started watching it and it was such a, <sighs> it was so boring. And I was like, ooh, this is good, keep it on. Because it wasn't the party that I had started. So I was like, cause if it was a party, I think that would have killed me. It was such a ba 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 boar fest. It was back to regular news. And I'm like, eh, could get that on my fucking app. Who needs this shit? And it literally changed the way I looked at things. I was like, this is awesome. I don't ever want to go back to that. When people say, do you want to go back to TV? No, it's not TV. It's like, it's all podcasts and it's all on your phone. I don't know. Do you feel that it's way, different. Steve? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. You still, you have an attachment to television? Yes. You do. It's on 24 hours a day in my house. My house as well. But I don't have the attachment to be on it anymore. I did. Not anymore. No, not when I look in the mirror. Stop it. Let's not do that. Stop. Yeah. No, come on. You, It's different for men. You know that. I'm not pandering. No, but you, you do know that. that. Yeah. But you know that. It right. is. Like, you guys can get silver and older and fabulous. And, you know, we were talking about, we're watching that new series. Heather and I are watching, um, well, first of all, we're watching Ripley, fabulous. Oh, I want to watch that. I it's haven't gotten to it It's incredible. I finished it today. And the other one we're watching uh, is with Colin Farrell called Sugar. And... He's getting older. And I said, you know, he's going to be like Piers Brosnan, those Irishmen, the way they, it, like, it doesn't matter. They look, they look great. And she's like, yeah. And think about Heather Locklear, the, because we were reading People. And I go, were, were you ever like one of 50 most beautiful, whatever the fuck that is? And she's like, eh, I don't know, maybe way back when, like 500 years ago, like she makes fun of everything. But it's so, the age thing is so interesting because Think of her, Melrose Place, and she hosted the VH1 Award. She's this beautiful icon. And like I said to her in her garage, there's like this poster she had, the first one she did with Got Milk. And I was like, 
like, look at you, you're such a baby. She was like 17. And I go, don't you just look at that and go, yeah, that's me. You know, or see your beautiful Clairol commercials. Like, yeah, that's me. She goes, no, I don't. She goes, I, that's what I want to be again. Well, I don't have that. Like, I'll be like, yeah, that's me. I accomplished that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I, it's cool. It's kind of like the Pamela Anderson thing where you move back to Canada and don't wear makeup and don't give a shit. That is the most beautiful thing ever. I think. And on that note. <laughs> the most beautiful thing ever. Thank you, Steve Kometko. <laughs> Still Here Hollywood is a production of the Still Here Network. All things technical run by Justin Zangerly. Theme music by Brian Sanishin. And executive producer is Jim Lichtenstein. <laughs>